mind and sense and sensibility. A passionate kiss or a violent embrace. A kiss or embrace of any kind, for that matter. Any portrayal of a marriage proposal. Any depiction of a wedding ceremony. Anyone speaking the words, I love you. Here are a few of the things that you will find in sense and sensibility. Ruthlessness. Venality. Arrogance. Avarice. Fecklessness. Snobbishness. Shamelessness. Two or three of the most unbridled talkers in all of Western literature. <laughs> and an authorial voice that mocks them all into immortality. I rest my case. In Jane Austen, we have one of the great social satirists of all time. Because she was a woman, living at a time when marriage was the only means by which a woman could alter the condition of her life, that's what she wrote about. To call her, for that reason, a writer of romances is the kind of cloddish thinking that she'd take relish in eviscerating. Two or three strokes of her scalding pen, and there'd be you all over the cobblestones. <laughs> So then I moved on to Pride and Prejudice, which of course is my favorite novel in the canon. I'm not alone there. Um, but well, this is what this is how I opened my, my study of uh, Pride and Prejudice. Jane Austen's second published novel is one of the best known and best loved in the English language, so much so that it's almost impossible to see it clearly any longer. It's become a set of fixed images and responses in our collective mind. Perhaps only Dickens's A Christmas Carol has undergone so thorough a metamorphosis from literary work to cultural bulwark. <laughs> Bogged down by the accumulated accretions of generations who know it only second or third hand, like those people who were reading you know, in title. Um, who know it only by reputation, a kind of ripple effect across the surface of Western civilization. Familiar familiarity by osmosis. Whenever it's mentioned, we no longer even hear the dissonance of the title. Just, it's just a series of syllables, a consumerist trigger. Not pride and prejudice, but pride and prejudice. <laughs> it is, in these post-literate days, less a novel than a brand. And like all powerful powerhouse brands, it's proved capable of spawning sub-brands. The most successful, and in my opinion, the most insidious, being that which currently boasts legions of frenzied, maniac-like devotees, who'd as soon rip Austin's moldering carcass to shreds than grant her even a posthumous claim on her own creation. I speak, of course, of the great, the dreaded, invoke it at your peril, Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> What's been lost in all this, alas, is the original novel, which, when it's read these days at all, is undertaken by people who already who are convinced they always know it, that they knew it in utero. <laughs> we don't just read it, they read it with intent. We all strive to find what we need in stories. We furnish what we can in between the lines to make the text more amenable to us, to reflect us better. But with the ex possible exception of the New Testament, no other seminal text has been so greedily trawled for evidence of the reader's own transcendent superiority. <laughs>